I always do this. I start talking and I'm mute. That's one of the occupational hazards of Zoom. Hey, we're back at Red May. Anyway, you're one month vacation from capitalism. I don't know, this is like day, what are we, day 22 or something. Um, we've got about eight days to go. We have uh, 100 and, wait, 43 programs in total, 110 speakers, as Al Pacino would say, wow. Anyway, uh, maybe you'd like to know some of the things that are coming up so you can see them. Uh, well, whether you would like to know it or not, I'm gonna tell you about some. So uh, this afternoon at 3 p.m., uh, we have a new trans English translation of Capital with Paul North and Paul Ryder. Uh, that will be moderated by Ever Osorio Ruiz. Uh, tomorrow at 11 a.m., we have uh, We Still Want Everything. That's a tribute to the 50th anniversary of Nani Balestrini's uh, book, We Want Everything. Uh, Rachel Kushner will be on that panel, Franco Bifo Berardi, Jasper Burns will moder uh, moderate, and uh, Maria Teresa Carboni. Uh, on tomorrow morning at, uh, no, I'm sorry, tomorrow afternoon at 2 p.m., class struggle and racial justice after the union drive at Amazon in Alabama. That's another panel like today's panel brought to us from our friends at Spectre Journal, which you should all subscribe to. Uh, we have David McNally as the moderator on that with Mike Goldfield and Donna Murch. At 5 p.m., Value, Capitalism, and Communism uh, with Jasper Burns, Cordelia Belton, and Kailas Srinivasan. Uh, we take two days of rest. Woo, I need it. And then on Wednesday, we start up again at uh, 11 a.m with There Is No Unhappy Revolution, which is a new book by Marcelo Terry. Uh, Idris Robinson and Alessandra Renzi will be on that panel with a number of other people, uh, surprise guests, mystery guests, we will see who. Uh, at 5 p.m., Mark's Asia History, with Rebecca Carl, Gavin Walker, Ken Kawashima, and Asad Haider as the moderator. At 11 a.m. on Thursday, the 27th, Critical Theory in the 21st Century with Amy Das, uh, Christian Lotz as moderator, and Chris O'Kane and Werner Bonefeld, who are the co-editors with Beverly Best of the wonderful Sage Handbook to Frankfurt School uh, uh, Critical Theory, a uh, 1,000-page uh, treasure trove of information uh, and up-to-date uh, review of the literature. Uh, at 5 p.m., on Thursday, counterinsurgency policing with Omedi Ocheng, Paul Passavan, Stuart Trader, Tavis T. Harris, Paige May, Samantha Pre Gonzalez, and Charmaine Schwa. And at 11 a.m., debt after graver collection and, collection and repossession uh, with Max Haven, Cassie Thornton, Radhika Desai, Lee Claire LaBerge, and Andrew Ross. So plenty of good stuff coming up. Uh, you, you might be asking, how do you fund this? What institutions exist for funding a festival? Call, which, one of whose slogans is be a commie for a month. Well, there are exactly no institutions in America that fund that. We depend on your generosity. You can demonstrate it uh, on our website under donate. You can go to Fan the Flames of Red Bay, which is our GoFundMe, or you can uh, become a patron uh, and uh, join our Patreon, which is uh, available at $5, uh, $3, $5, $10, and $20. Uh, so uh, also you can look at the YouTube description of the event, uh, and that will uh, to give you a link that will take you directly uh, to our uh, GoFundMe. So uh, I want to now uh, welcome uh, Zach Levinson, one of the editors of uh, Spectre Journal, who uh, put this panel together, uh, teaches at the University of North Carolina. Is that right, uh, Zach? Or have I got the... the, the it, yeah, yeah. It is North at, at UNC Greensboro. UNC Greensboro, okay. There are probably a, mm -hmm. a number of UNCs in the, uh, Zach's a sociologist, uh, but we don't hold that against him. 
And uh, Zach will uh, introduce our panel today as we celebrate and interrogate the 150th anniversary of the Paris Commune. Welcome to Red May again, Zach. Uh, uh, may you always be a welcome guest in this house. Thank you, Philip. Um, so 150 years ago yesterday was the beginning of Bloody Week, which marked the end of the Paris Commune. So roughly 20,000 communards were killed, nearly 50,000 arrested, and government troops put an end to this experiment in direct democracy known to us as the Paris Commune. Today, I'm pleased to moderate this discussion of the Commune's 150th anniversary with our distinguished panelists, Carolyn Eichner and Stathis Kouvalakis. So thanks to both the journal Spectre and to Red May for putting this together, um, especially Philip, but to everyone at Red May and to both Carolyn and Stathis for agreeing to participate. So what I'm gonna do is introduce them both now and then we'll hear from Carolyn and then, then from Stathis. Then I'll facilitate a discussion for the remainder of the hour and then we'll take questions from viewers. So let me start uh, by introducing Stathis. So Stathis Kouvalakis is an independent researcher based in Paris and a longtime activist on the anti-capitalist left in France and Greece. He's published extensively on Marxism, critical theory, and social movements. Most recently, he's edited a new collection in French of Marx and Engels' writings on the Commune. Um, and I highly, highly recommend reading his, what's really a book-length introduction to the volume, available in three parts, translated into English on the Verso blog. Um, I also highly recommend his book, Philosophy and Revolution, and as well as his just released co-edited Rutledge Handbook of Marxism and Post-Marxism. This thing is like, uh, like Philip said, a real treasure trove. But first we're gonna hear from Carolyn Eichner, a feminist historian at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. She's the author of another highly recommended book, Surmounting the Barricades, Women in the Paris Commune, which came out in 2004 and was translated into French last year. And she has not one, but two books on the way. So first, and most appropriate for, for today's event, The Paris Commune, A Brief History, coming out this year from Rutgers. And it examines the commune as a critical revolutionary, political, economic, and sociocultural event, underscoring its role as a capacious model for radical change. And the next year, coming out on Cornell, is her book, Feminism's Empire, in which she investigates entanglements of feminism and imperialism in contexts including France, New Caledonia, Algeria, Turkey, Russia, and the American West. So we'll begin today with a presentation from Carolyn, and then I'll turn it over to, to Stathis, and then I'll lead a, a brief discussion. Um, so be thinking of your questions throughout, submit them via the chat, and without further ado, let me turn it over to Carolyn. Thanks very much, Zach and Philip, and thanks to Red May for inviting me to participate. Um, I've very much been looking forward to this, so I'll just uh, begin. Nearly 10,000 people crowded into the Tuileries Palace on Sunday afternoon, May 21st, 1871, for a grand concert benefiting the battlefield hospitals of the revolutionary civil war known as the Paris Commune. Entering through gardens illuminated by red lanterns woven through the trees, attendees arrived in opulent rooms, quote, upholstered, upholstered in crimson velvet accented by golden screens, close quote. The audience waited to experience the widely advertised extravaganza of, quote, orations, singing, and perhaps dancing, close quote, by Paris's top performers who shared the stage with 1,500 musicians. Louis Baron, a 24-year-old member of the commune government, observed that rather than the usual aristocratic spectators, the, quote, crystal chandelier blazing from the ceiling, close quote, illuminated a crowd that included working women and men, people, quote, who seemed to say, finally, we are in our house, in our palace. We have driven out the tyrant, and we can now use this place as we please, close quote. Awaiting the performance, the communard journalist Maxime Boyome observed, quote, a long, long table, hundreds of glasses, bottles, mountains of brioche, a rich abundance for all to share. Boyome felt a buzz, buzz of impatience run through the crowd until finally, quote, the curtain rose. 
silence on the stage of strong woman, La Borda. Revolutionary belt around her waist, the renowned performer began to sing La Canaille, the rabble, the working class anthem for which she was famous. Her voice unleashed the story of the common people, quote, their sons born on straw have only a slum for a palace, close quote. Yet now La Canaille filled the lavish rooms of Francis Tuileries Palace. Quote, it is the honest man, La Borda continued to sing, whose hand by pen or hammer pays with sweat for his bit of the bread, close quote. Mid song, a Parisian national guardsman, a member of the commune's army, strode on stage and quote, handed the artist a flag which she slowly unfurled and wrapped herself in. She continued to sing and it was a gripping spectacle, close quote. Holding a dazzling and dramatic festival in the tradition of the great French revolution, the commune government welcomed all Parisians to the once royal residence, now resplendent in the red flag of revolution. The spectacular palace concert embodied the inclusive and liberatory politics of the Paris commune. Rejoicing in the triumph of the people of Paris, who had taken control of their city and cast off the repressive French national government, the concert represented a new society under a municipal government directly responsible to its citizens. It celebrated the collective experiment toward erasing class and gender inequities, the end of labor abuses and exploitations, the elimination of the oppressive police force, the democratization of education and the arts, and the creation of a revolutionary sense of community. The commune had flung open the Tuileries Palace doors to the people of Paris. In this once elite space, the formerly excluded citizens basked in art, music, abundance, and liberty long denied them. At the same moment on the afternoon of May 21st, the French National Army slipped through the unguarded section of Paris's city walls, aiming for not only military conquest, but also mass slaughter of Parisians. When the uprising had begun two months earlier, the French national government had abandoned Paris for Versailles, the old royal city. On May 21st, a Versailles sympathizer named Jules Ducatel saw the Pont du Jour gate left unprotected. He scaled the wall, and waved a white handkerchief to signal the governmental troops stationed just outside. Naval Captain Auguste Treve saw the sign, investigated, determined that the gate was indeed undefended, and marched the first National Army soldiers into Paris. Behind them, the 130,000 troops that had held Paris under siege for two months, ready to inundate the city. They had a single goal, to destroy the commune, Adolphe Thiers, head of the French government, had sworn at the beginning of the conflict to defend order. In his eyes and those of most of the national government and the military and the bourgeoisie, the peasantry and the Catholic church, the commune embodied the antithesis of order. The uprising's toppling of hierarchies and its attempts to radically recreate relations of power and authority profoundly angered and frightened those defenders of order and the status quo. While the army's loyalties were many to the state, to religion, to capitalism, and to the traditional family, its unified aim was to def definitively reassert French authority over Paris. The communards takeover of the capital and the subsequent months of revolutionary civil war had exponentially intensified the wrath that Thiers and the forces of order felt toward the insurgents, people who actively worked to undermine their dominance. To this end, the army hurtled into Paris on May 21st. From generals to infantry, they intended to show no mercy to the revolutionaries. One week later, the Tuileries Palace smoldered in ashes and across the city, as many as 15 to 20,000 Parisians lay dead. In what became known as the Bloody Week, communard men and women battled the army on the streets, behind barricades built by ripping up paving stones and heaping horse carts, furniture, barrels, window frames, books, and anything else at hand, attempting to defend their egalitarian society. The Bloody Week saw the Versailles government, in the name of order, use overwhelming force to not only extinguish the commune and all it represented, but also to exterminate the people who built it. Infantry and cavalry of all ranks ruthlessly attacked Parisian men, women, and children, 
leaving, quote, mountains of cadavers in the streets, assaulting citizens as they would, quote, wild beasts, ferocious, sinister enemies of France, as army officer Eugène Enabert described the communards. Communard Louise Michel reported, quote, the machine guns roared. They killed as in a hunt. It was a human butchery. The French National Army became the first military force to use machine guns on mass, for mass ex executions, and they used them on their own citizens. In the fighting, the Tuileries Palace, the Hotel de Ville, the City Hall, the Prefecture of Police, and the law courts went up in flames. Versailles blamed working class women for starting the, the fires, reacting against the significant feminist activism during the commune. This justified shooting any suspicious looking woman or child, children were considered accomplices, accomplices. Merely a working class appearance qualified one as suspicious. Some of the cap captured communard women and men faced immediate execution, while thousands of others experienced arrest, battlefield court martial, summary trials, and firing squads. The Paris correspondent of the London Standard newspaper reported, the wholesale executions continue indiscriminately. At one of these, since last night, 500 persons have been shot. There are invariably women and boys among them. Prisoners are soon disposed of by a volley and tumbled into a trench when, if not killed by the shots, death from suffocation must soon put an end to their pain. The French military and political authorities did nothing to stop the slaughter. The forces of order intended to not only decimate the revolution and the revolutionaries, but to make clear that radical activism, socialism, anarchism, labor, labor movements, and feminism could and would be crushed. Aware that the eyes of the world were on them, Thiers and his government hoped to unambiguously demonstrate the brutal fate awaiting anyone attempting to rise up against the power of the state. The Paris Commune was the French Revolutionary Civil War that rocked the 19th century and shaped the 20th. Considered a golden moment of hope and potential by the left, a black hour of terrifying power inversions by the right, the commune occupies a critical position in understanding modern history and politics. A 72-day conflict that ended with the ferocious slaughter of Parisians, the commune represents for some the final insurgent burst of the French Revolution's long wake, for others the first successful socialist uprising and for yet others, an archetype for egalitarian socioeconomic and political change. The commune looms large in histories of France, the 19th century, 19th century Europe, 20th century revolutions and civil wars, as well as socialism, anarchism, and feminism. Militants have referenced and incorporated its ideas into insurrections across the globe throughout the 20th and into the 21st centuries, keeping alive the revolution's now iconic goals and images. Innumerable scholars in countless languages have examined aspects of the 1871 uprising, taking perspectives ranging from glorifying to damning this world-shaking event. The commune stands as a critical and pivotal moment in 19th century history, as the linchpin between revolutionary pasts and futures, and as the crucible allowing glimpses of alternate possibilities. Upending hierarchies of class, religion, and gender, the commune emerged as a touchstone for the subsequent century and a half of revolutionary and radical social movements. The commune developed as more than one revolution, overturning political, economic, and sociocultural structures. From the explosive formation of radical government to the establishment of grassroots political clubs, the political revolution involved socialism and anarchism, feminisms, anti-clericalism and the legacies of the French Revolution and France's Revolution of 1848. The economic revolt centered on the class and gender-based reorganization and revaluing of labor, the undermining of capitalism, and the centering of cooperation and association. The socio-cultural revolution involved the social change that the economic and political revolutions would bring to people's lives. This included legal changes that ended the exclusionary category of illegitimate for natural children, recognized free unions as equal to state and church sanctioned marriages, and introduced mandatory secular schooling for girls and boys. Popular festivals, an expansive free press, and an artist association counted among creative sociocultural innovations that altered the texture of life and the parameters of class and gender. 
the communards began recreating the society around them, revolutionizing what a city and a nation could be, expanding opportunities and opening paths to new worlds. The March 18th uprising against the French National Army thrust the Central Committee of the Parisian National Guard, the People's Army, into a position of insurgent leadership. Questions of legitimacy and legality immediately emerged as highly contested, immediately emerged as highly contested flashpoints in the negotiations over power and control of Paris. At the March 19th meeting of the Central Committee, the Blanquiste, follower of revolutionary socialist Auguste Blanqui, argued for immediate military action against Versailles, seeking to take advantage of the army's present state of disarray. The moderate socialists on the committee resisted. Contending that their role consisted of protecting municipal rights, the fight for which had underlain the uprising, this faction insisted on electing a government that would have legitimacy. The Central Committee clarified this position in a second proclamation, one directed to the National Guard on March 19th. Quote, you have charged us with organizing the defense of Paris and of your rights. We know we have accomplished this mission, aided by your generous courage and your admirable calm. We have chased out this treasonous government. Now our mandate is expired. Prepare to hold communal elections and give yourselves the one thing that we could barely hope for, the establishment of the true republic." Close quote. The Central Committee's statement and, ac and actions reflected the dominance, dominance of the French internationalists, the moderate associationist socialists in the group. They strove for the organization and empowerment of the working class. In contrast, the Blanquistes sought the overthrow of the bourgeois order by a small conspiratorial group of revolutionaries. Louise Michel, a Blanquiste at this point, but her politics would dramatically change after the commune when she became an anarchist, lamented the committee's refusal to attack Versailles mili uh, militarily. Michel said, quote, if these devoted men had had less respect for legality, it would have been aptly named the revolutionary commune on the road to Versailles, close quote. She also regretted not taking more drastic action herself, affirming, quote, I would have without blanching taken the life of the head of the revolutionary, uh, of the reactionary Republic Thiers, quote, Rivers of blood would not have flowed. Piles of dead as high as mountains would not have filled Paris and turned into a mass grave, close quote. She believed that if she had killed Thiers in the midst of the Versailles government in the assembly, quote, the resultant terror would have stopped the reaction. Our two lives would have prevented the slaughter of Paris, close quote. To Michelle, adhering to law at the hour of insurgency contradicted and undercut the revolutionary circumstances. The newspaper Le Cri du Peuple, edited by newly elected Commune Council member Jules Vallès, exalted, quote, the Commune is proclaimed. It has come from the ballot box, triumphant, sovereign, and armed, close quote. Then using sexualized and familial language to gender the Commune and citizens male, the article rejoiced in that, quote, the citizen soldier would fertilize the newly revolutionary, revolutionized city, quote. Today, idea weds revolution. Tomorrow, the citizen soldier, in order to fertilize the just married and acclaimed municipality, must retake his place at the workbench, always proud but now free." Close quote. The statement reflects assumptions of citizenship as, as male and about the political centrality of men's labor. It also underscored the importance of the ballot box, emphasizing the revolutionary's focus on legality. Following elections on the day of its inauguration, the new commune government issued its first official statement, assuring Parisians, quote, you are the masters of your destiny. With your support, the representation that you have established will repair the disasters cre created by the disgraced power, close quote. They spoke of themselves as chosen by the li newly liberated people to rectify with the support of the people, the calamitous situation created by Thiers and his government. Rather than a representative system, the communards conceptualized their government as a direct democracy, one in which all elected positions were revocable. They believed that the source of all power rested in the people. 
Elected through universal male suffrage, the Commune Council was chosen by only half of the adult population. Women remained disenfranchised from electoral politics. While feminists had focused on gaining political rights under the Second Empire, France's previous government, the Commune brought larger possibilities. Most women sought neither the vote nor a formal governing role. During the Commune, feminists saw the potentials of liberation expand beyond parity with men under an oppressive regime. Working class women strove for concrete change in their lives, not the ability to vote. Suffrage had an abstract value, one recognized primarily by those without day-to-day -day concerns of survival. Most bourgeois feminists, along with the majority of the city's elites, had fled Paris under the 1870 Prussian siege of Paris, and more left after the March 18th revolt. The feminists who remained in Paris, primarily socialists and members of the working class, sought change not only regarding gender, but also of class for both personal and political reasons. Socialist feminists considered the commune the dawn of the social revolution and saw new political forms on the horizon. They understood the commune as transitional to a new egalitarian society. Female communards thus engaged extensively in a broad range of political acts, actions that constituted politics outside of government. During the commune, activist women formed grassroots political clubs, established vigilance committees, joined military brigades, aided and fed the wounded, published newspapers, developed co-educational schools, operated soup kitchens, rounded up deserters, and created producer-owned cooperatives. Elite socialist women, including the well-known feminist novelist and journalist Andre Leo, who, Andre Leo, who published the socialist newspaper La Sociale, and Elizabeth Dmitriev, a Russian who established the citywide Union des Femmes, Women's Union, strove to enact feminist and socialist goals they had theorized and planned before the insurrection. Working class women and men enthusiastically and avidly participated in political clubs, some single sex, some mixed. Most clubs met in churches, appropriating space from the wealthy and powerful Catholic church against which much of the Parisian working class expressed strong anti-clericalism. Political clubs evolved as arenas of popular sovereignty, as locations for grassroots political expression and engagement. Working class clubistes, as the participants were known, developed political positions that emerged from their lived experience of class-based exploitation and marginalization, their conscious perpetuation of France's revolutionary tradition, and their deep anti-clericalism. Clubistes advocated cooperation and association, ideas antithetical to capitalism and fundamental to labor and many socialist movements. For Club East women, subjugation in the family and their particularly gendered experiences in the workplace, simultaneously laborers and women, contributed to their radicalization. Spaces of organic working class exposition and engagement, the clubs constituted examples of lively and extensive politics beyond government. Although the commune government was a revolutionary regime, the people in the political clubs tended to take even more radical positions. As the community bulletin published by the club Saint Nicolas de Champ urged, quote, people govern yourselves through your public meetings, your press, pressure those who represent you. They will never be revolutionary enough, close quote. Many club meetings directed questions and suggestions to the commune council and they expected answers. In these ways, Clubs exercised popular sovereignty, influencing the commune government from the grassroots. The commune emerged as a site of alternative governing and political engagement, one in which extra governmental forces played integral and extensive roles. Recognizing not only women's extensive roles in the commune, but also the ways in which the commune itself was gendered allows a clearer understanding of the revolution and of its broad, broader context. Rather than a strictly masculine revolutionary governmental and militarized milieu, the commune emerged from and consisted of multiple strands of revolutionary socialist feminists. Feminism, playing out in political clubs, journalism, labor organizing, vigilance committees, educational reforms, and in a range of battlefield functions. Overthrowing existing gender hierarchies as well as those of class and religion constituted the fundamental goals of the Paris Commune.
Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Carolyn. Um, so before I pass it over to, to Stathis, I just want to mention, we're going to return to a number of the themes that, that Carolyn just raised um, in the discussion. And I also forgot to mention um, that Stathis published a really, really interesting interview on the commune yesterday in Jacobin. Uh, he did an interview with David Broder, highly recommended. It's on the Jacobin homepage right now. But um, let me pass it off to Stathis Kubalak. Thank you, Zach. Um, thanks to Spectre and to Red May uh, for organizing this, uh, this discussion. Um, as you might have, have guessed, uh, my uh, topic will be more narrow than Caroline, who provided, I mean, an, an incredibly uh, broad uh, and rich overview, both of the commune, of the events of its significance uh, and uh, with a focus, of course, on uh, the role of revolutionary uh, women and feminism, although I think the term itself is a bit of an anachronism concerning the commune, but of course that's really the meaning of this. So let, let me start uh, a bit unusually uh, by making the more specific point about the impact of uh, the commune on the topic I know um, best, which is Marx, Engels, and uh, the tradition coming from, from this. Um, as you probably know, I mean, as many people know, uh, Marx and Engels, particularly Marx, is not considered as an especially feminist uh, thinker. We can certainly find in the socialist tradition, um, more particularly in France, uh, socialist thinkers much who have elaborated much more on uh, the issue of women's uh, oppression. Uh, for instance, the whole tradition coming from uh, the Saint-Simon uh, school, uh, which gave birth to an extremely important wave of uh, revolutionary feminism avant la lettre in the 1848 revolutions. Engels is a bit different, but let me first emphasize one immediate effect of the commune in the evolution of both Marx's thinking and um, on the international, uh, the International Working Men's Association, usually known as the First International. Four months after the end of the Commune in September 1871, uh, Marx, Engels, and the General Council of the International convene a conference of the International in London. So, not exactly a Congress, a bit below the Congress, but still a very important body that took um, decisive uh, decisions concerning the future orientations of the international and actually spread the seeds of its future split a uh, year later in, in the Hague Congress. Uh, the main focus was, was on the necessity of the political action of the working class, of turning actually the international itself from an international very heterogeneous uh, components to an international or much more structured political organizations, parties if you prefer, uh, that would intervene actively in the political scene and whenever possible in countries of continental Europe, uh, but also uh, Britain or England uh, more particularly, participate in um, the electoral uh, scene. However, there were two uh, decisions uh, which caused quite a bit of a discussion during this uh, conference. Uh, and these two decisions are significant because both of them point to what has been until then either a blind spot or even a dark spot in uh, the trajectory of the international. The first decision was to create specific non-mixed women's section in the international. And the second was about creating uh, sections of uh, in the countryside of, of peasants or agricultural producers, as they uh, were called in, uh, in the resolution, and therefore to redeploy somehow the organizational network of the international to cover the countryside. Both of them uh, were, both of those decisions were introduced by Marx himself, and both of them in reference to the commune. So when introducing this proposal for creating a women's section, Marx says, 
in the commune, women uh, show that uh, they show their political capacity, and he emphasizes they were more active and more brave than men. And uh, his proposal is immediately met with objections by a significant part of the delegates in the Congress, among them the um, leader of the Belgian socialist, uh, César de Pep, uh, who says, but what are you doing? Do you want to create a kind of parallel international where, where women would, would rule and, and decide and this, this would disorganize everything and so on? And Marx replies, apparently quite calmly, um, if we believe the records, and says, look, first of all, we already have mixed sections, huh? sections of both men and women. And secondly, uh, in places, countries where industrialization progresses, well, women workers uh, have the need to discuss uh, issues, uh, to organize uh, and uh, uh, among themselves, uh, between women. So he was already defending uh, the principle of non-mixed, if you like, uh, sections of the international. And this re resolution was adopted by a very broad majority, actually. Uh, it didn't materialize uh, itself, but it's certainly a turning point in the long and troubled uh, history of the relations between uh, the workers' movement, the socialist movement, and the women's movement. I'm not suggesting that you know everything became harmonious and straightforward after that. That would be very far from truth. And in her book, Caroline, for instance, um, emphasized a lot the difficulties that uh, Paul Lank, a very significant uh, figure of um, uh, revolutionary feminism of that period, encountered in the decades after the Commune, uh, although she was close and associated with the political currents which in France were the closest to uh, Marx and Engels, huh? the, the Workers' Party of Jules Guedes, and uh, for some uh, uh, for some time also the Blankies of uh, Edouard Vaillant, also very close actually to, uh, to to Marx. So not everything was straightforward, but however, from that moment onwards, the women's question became the focus of intense debates in uh, the international workers and socialist movement, and in socialist theory itself. Huh? It's in the wake of the commune that in 1879, we have August Bebel's book, uh, Women and Socialism, so a landmark in uh, the history of socialist thought on the, um, on the women's question. And we have Engels, of course, uh, a few years later in 84, with his origin of um, uh, uh, the, the family, uh, private property, and uh, the state, uh, which is also a very significant uh, breakthrough and, and covers uh, a whole field uh, of which, you know, the women's issue is only uh, one part uh, on which Marx and, Eng and Engels haven't elaborated so far. The second question, the second point uh, uh, that was decided in that conference, uh, I've mentioned it is about creating uh, sections in the countryside. Um, I will not uh, at that now immediately elaborate on this because I want to return on this in the, in the discussion, but here again, we find the lesson of the commune because uh, not only for uh, Marx and Engels, but it was more broadly accepted that the ultimate reason for the failure of the commune to initiate uh, a nationwide uh, social revolution in France was uh, the gap, uh, the sharp divide between Paris and the other cities, including the cities which experienced uh, insurgencies and uh, uh, revolutionary communes that uh, didn't last for very long, but but still it was very significant as a movement in Marseille, in Lyon, and in other uh, cities of southern France, more specifically. And uh, the gap so between Paris, the rest of the cities, but more profoundly between the cities and the countryside. And this materialized because uh, uh, the majority, the reactionary majority, dominating the National Assembly that was elected in February, so uh, a month or so before the start of the Commune, was dominated not even by Republicans, not even by moderate Republicans, but by straightforward monarchists and Bonapartists, which were overwhelmingly elected in uh, the rural constituencies of France. And, and we know how deep, you know, how important it is if you want to understand the political history of France in the 19th century, this great divide between 
uh, the city and the countryside. And this has been thematized also not only in, you know, in history and uh, political, um, political writings and so on, but also in French literature. Huh? If you read you know, French novels from Balzac, uh, The Peasants, uh, uh, Georges Sand, uh, and so on, this, this, this gap, and Zola, of course, I mean, the gap between the countryside and, and the city is absolutely the major theme, actually, of, of uh, French French realism. I mean, if, even Flaubert, in a sense, uh, represents a kind of variant of this um, uh, enormous gap between the countryside and the city. So Marx understands that you know this uh, needs to be filled, and uh, the lesson uh, he will draw eventually. And here, of course, uh, uh, the Russian revolutionaries, including a figure which was mentioned and quite rightly so uh, by Caroline in her presentation, Elizabeth. Dmitriev, they do play a role and eventually the other uh, activists because they will orient Marx towards an understanding of not only the situation of the peasantry in Russia, but also of the political capacity of uh, the peasantry and of its specific form of organization, which mind you, which mind you is uh, called the commune or the community, the obchina, uh, so the Russian rural uh, commune as a possible basis, not just as a residue of the past, uh, but also as a possible basis for the deeper social reorganization of uh, the countries in the periphery of the world capitalist uh, system. But this is a point I want to uh, return on uh, possibly a bit later in the discussion, uh, if we can. Uh, now, for the rest of my presentation, I will just make one point, but this is the central one. What is in a way, the meaning of the commune in, uh, for, for Marx. Um, and my point will be essentially not to present you, you know, point by point, everything that is said in the civil war in France, but uh, try to stress what is the specificity of Marx's method, if you like, of, of the way he sees uh, the commune. Because this is, I think, the most useful uh, part for us now and, and the, the best starting point actually for our own approach to Marx, Engels and, and this whole tradition. The fundamental point here is that Marx doesn't see the commune as the confirmation or the concretization of any kind of pre-existing socialist and communist doctrine, including of course his own theory. And I want here to remind the decisive sentences in which this idea is expressed in uh, the civil war in France. Uh, the great social measure of uh, the commune was its own working existence. Uh, the working class did not expect miracles from the commune. They have no ready-made utopias to introduce by popular decree. They have no ideals to realize but to set free the elements of the new society with which old collapsing bourgeois society itself is pregnant. Huh? So you see that uh, Marx in a way reads uh, the commune focusing on the new elements it brings, but he doesn't see these elements as forming as a kind of fully constituted new model uh, which should and would be copied by future revolutions. I don't mean by this that there aren't fundamental dimensions in the commune uh, that have a broader significance and value. They are, and Marx will uh, very strongly emphasize uh, these, uh, these dimensions. But essentially, uh, what he wants to say, I think, is that the commune is not the end of the road. It's not, it's not the solution as such. It is a framework in which a whole range of experiments became, become possible, become possible at last because the commune removes the structural uh, impediments and obstacles to social transformation uh, that exist uh, in bourgeois society, in capitalist society, and more specifically, those constraints and obstacles which are uh, imposed by uh, the bourgeois state as a specific bureaucratic, oppressive, and repressive 
uh, apparatus. Uh, in uh, the, um, the first draft of uh, the civil war in France, this idea is formulated in the following terms. We find it again in, in the civil war, in only slightly modified, but here it's much more dense. Uh, so uh, Marx says, such is the commune, the political form of the social emancipation, of the liberation of labor from the usurpation of the monopolies of the means of labor. The commune does not do away with the class struggles through which the working class strives for the abolition of all classes. Um, it's uh, not the social movement of the working class and therefore of the general regeneration of mankind, but the organized means of action. It is, it affords the rational medium in which that class struggle can run through its different phases in the most rational and humane way. So I think that um, Marx's uh, way of seeing the commune as a specific form, actually, and here is where, where its novelty lies, is very close to a point made brilliantly by Caroline in, uh, when discussing in her book uh, the views of André Léo, um, the socialist feminist, which she referred to in her presentation as well, um, when she, she writes in page, page 97-98, I, I quote, rather than viewing revolution as a solution it itself, she conceived of it as the creation of the space in which to construct and develop transformative change. And I think this is very, very close to the method uh, that Marx adopts in the civil war in, in France. So what is the innovation of uh, the commune and the new elements it brought? Well, uh, the new, cert, new, new in general, but new more particularly for Marx because they will imply a very significant change in crucial points of his own political thinking. And the most famous formulation of this uh, is uh, the preface Engels and him will write a few months later for the German um, republishing a uh, new edition of the Communist Manifesto. And in this preface, actually, the only one they will sign jointly, Marx and Engels, uh, they say um, a large part of what we wrote in the manifesto in the program is now outdated. The commune, more specifically, has shown that it's impossible to take the state machinery for the working class to take, to seize the state machinery as such, and to use it for its own purposes. And in the civil war in France, Marx shows that uh, the state machinery needs to be radically change that a very deep rupture without state machinery is absolutely necessary. And therein lies for Marx uh, the significant innovation of uh, the commune. Um, let me illustrate this by, by this point. Um, the ordinary discourse now, and I speak now of you know, historians and uh, on, on the left, uh, including socialist historians in France when talking about the commune, is to say that you see, the commune itself is in the continuity of the French revolutionary and socialist tradition of the 19th century. It's the idea of a social and democratic republic. Okay, fine. But the social and democratic republic was uh, the kind of very, the key formulation of the 1848 uh, revolution. Is the commune just a repetition of the 1848 revolution? Marx says no. Of course, there is a very strong continuity. Of course, he even says the spectre of 1848 uh, come back now and, 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 and leave again. He very clearly sees elements that make a continuity not only with 1848, but also with uh, the French Revolution of 89 and 93, more specifically. But what is new about the commune? Well, it's precisely the commune itself. <laughs> the commune as a political form. This is what didn't exist in 1848. And uh, this radical novelty in uh, the commune means that it introduces a rupture with the bourgeois state that makes it possible to pose concretely and not in the very vague terms of the 48 aspirations. It poses very concretely, it can actually 
uh, pose the question of the emancipation of, uh, of labor. Hence, the famous formulations of, of, of Marx that it is the, um, uh, it was essentially a working class government, not only because of its sociological composition, not only because nearly half of the elected people in uh, the Council of the Commune uh, were working class people, but, and uh, I quote again uh, this passage from uh, the Civil War, it is the produce of the struggle of the producing against the appropriating class. Please know the terms, huh? the producing class, not just the working class, but the producers, something broader. Huh? Uh, the political form at last discovered under which to work out the economical emancipation of labor. So the comment for Marx didn't uh, propose uh, the solution, as I said before, but it posed the crucial problem of a new form of power that emerged uh, to a certain extent during those 72 days in, in Paris. This was the first time in a way in world history that a totally new block of social forces Dom dominated by the working class, by the Parisian proletariat, not only uh, raised up, took arms and attacked the power, because this has happened already in June 1848, but seized power, okay, within the limits of the city, but not any city, the most emblematic uh, city of the 19th century, like Walter Benjamin famously said, uh, the capital of the 19th century, uh, and, and, and exercised power for 72 days. And this totally new, unprecedented experience showed two things as far as the specificity of its political form is concerned. The first is that uh, you need to destroy a certain number of things that are precisely those structural obstacles to social emancipation and transformation. First of them, of course, the repressive apparatuses of the state. Huh? And the first decree of the commune, Marx puts a lot of emphasis on this, is the abolition of uh, the permanent army and its replacement by the National Guard and by the people in arms. And then uh, the Commune brought all those measures that have been um, elaborated, discussed, that have fermented in the French workers' movement for years and years, actually, about the ways for people to control, actually, the power of the representatives and to control the administrative machine that implements concretely the decisions taken by the political power. So it's not exactly direct democracy if we mean by this a pure abolition of any form of representation. Besides, the commune was itself an elected body. Huh? It had its own executive uh, instance, uh, the executive committee. All these people had been elected by mail, uh, general uh, suffrage. But what it did introduce is a whole series of procedures which could encourage and help all this grassroots activity that was there and to which Carolyn brilliantly referred to control those representatives to prevent them from becoming totally autonomous from the people who elected them, huh? such as uh, uh, the, uh, the mandat imperatif. So the fact that you have a mandate that is very precise, that, is, that you have to stick to it and, and, and more specifically that uh, you can be recalled uh, by the people who have elected you at any moment if you do not respect uh, the mandate you were given. And the same, the, an equivalent principle of electing uh, not just your political representatives, but electing also the key positions in state administration uh, so as to put the state bureaucracy, not to abolish it as a kind of specialized body, of course, to reduce its size by everything that is unnecessary and that excludes people from uh, the decision-making process. But to the extent that an administration is necessary and even a centralized administration, which again, the Commons saw it as a necessity, although of course at uh, you know, the, a kind of reasonable and, and reduced level, to put it under popular control with those mechanisms of uh, of election and, and, and permanent procedures of control at all, at all stages. An articulation, to put it simply, of the vertical and the horizontal dimension of power. And I think that to that respect, Marx was prescient in a way, because this is the problem which 
in a way, all the revolutions that came after the Commune, I mean, the social revolutions, uh, have been confronted to. None of them had, <laughs> has resolved it in a very satisfactory way. But because the Commune is the founding moment of that uh, long sequence, because uh, this is also why we find, again, these issues uh, as problems to be resolved in the most recent experiences where uh, even the word commune reemerges and uh, reappears. Uh, for instance, in uh, the liberated zones of uh, the Kurdistan in Syria, or in the experience of the revolutionary commune during the Bolivarian uh, revolution in Venezuela. But I'm sure that we can come back to all this in our discussion, and uh, I will stop here. Okay, well, thank you. That was, that was fantastic from both of you. Um, I was actually initially going to ask, to begin um, to ask you about the novelty of the form of the commune, but I think Stas has just given us a really, really nice account. And so instead of focusing on the means, let me focus on the ends here. And by that, I mean, um, I wanted to ask about the novelty of some of the politics that emerged from the commune and, and the experience of the commune. So there's this line in Carolyn's book, Surmounting the Barricades, I wanted to read that I thought provided a really compelling account um, of what was so novel about these socialist feminisms. She writes, most revolutionary women jettisoned political rights-based equality as a goal during the commune, even many who had embraced it earlier. So in a word, socialist feminists broke with the prevailing bourgeois liberal approach of existing feminisms. And so against this backdrop, I'd be interested in hearing both of you talk a bit about the novelty of the politics forged in, in the commune, you know, multiple strands of feminism, anarchism, socialism, syndicalism, so forth. Um, and I'm particularly interested in, in how central the experience of the commune was in forging these politics. Shall I be it? Sure. Um, so uh, in, in the context, you know, if you're talking about the, the, these women's organizations, the, the commune was absolutely fundamental to this kind of shift. Because during the, the Second Empire, there was a pretty significant feminist movement, but it was, it was across classes, but along lines of, you know, political rights, this kind of, you know, um, you know agreeable sort of bourgeois goals. And uh, these women who had, they were identified as socialists um, in the uh, 1860s, but there really wasn't much of a socialist feminist there. And then and there's something about, you know, the experience, the, the capaciousness of the commune, um, the event itself that became, it presented those possibilities instead of just, you know, instead of just seeking, but first of all, the vote is, the vote makes sense, you know, as, as I said, the vote makes sense if you don't have to worry about, you know, how you're going to feed your children and clothe your family and feed yourself and, you know, these sort of kind of fundamental things. And, and um, so the vote is, is, is abstract. And so, you know, during the commune, there's, there is this, obviously, you know, there's, there's voting, there's this election of this government, but for so many, um, Socialist feminist women, they, the, the radical women who were bourgeois who stayed, the socialists, and working class women, it was they were looking beyond the immediate. And they really saw you know, the commune as this kind of opening the door to the future and creating these possibilities. And so in this space, there emerged this range of socialist feminisms. And, and I actually want to address the, the word feminism. It's not that you said that it could be you know, seen as uh, anachronistic. And um, there was no word for feminists or feminisms, but there were women and men who had a politics that involved you know, creating a greater equity and um, removing uh, or lowering women's marginalization um, and uh, oppressions. And the, the word came into usage in the 1880s, Hubertine Auclair, a, 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 femi a feminist socialist, a Republican socialist, developed the word. But um, I use this word um, to describe feminists going back into the 18th century because that's, it's what they were and there is no other term for it. So in the commune though, this, the, 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 the feminist socialisms that emerged 
anarchist feminist, uh, uh, Paul Menk, um, who Sethi's mentioned, who was very much involved in the political clubs and had a, 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 a idea of a grassroots kind of an anarchist feminism. And actually in, in the aftermath of the commune, she thought that she was disillusioned and turned to a more um, Blanquiste initially and top down kind of feminism. But during the commune, she's involved in the political club. She's involved in this kind of a grassroots or anarchist um, socialist feminism. And then Elizabeth Dmitriev, who uh, had been a 20 year old Russian woman who had been briefly living in London um, as a representative of the uh, Russian emigre section of the, um, the International in Geneva. They sent her to, to London as, her, as their uh, representative and she was living with uh, Marx's daughters. And so she was a, I think she was a significant influence on Marx's thought as Stathis was saying. And he asked her to go to Paris to be his eyes and ears um, uh, at once the commune began. And she organized this uh, Union des Femmes, which was a highly centralized, top-down organization to reorganize women's labor, revalue women's labor, and also to defend the city. It was this kind of, it had these multiple um, goals, but this was intensely highly organized and probably the, probably the most extensive organization during the commune. Um, so, and then there were a number of other um, kinds of socialist feminism that developed in this time period, but I want to have, uh, give Stathis a chance to speak also. Um, thank you, Raleigh. Of course, I, I agree with everything uh, you, you said. Um, I'm, I'm not personally, I mean, let, let me cl clarify a few things. I think that, first of all, words, words are important. Um, most of the words that Zach used in, uh, when describing refer actually to realities that name themselves as such after the commune. For instance, Bakunin. Hmm? Let's take the example of Bakunin. Bakunin doesn't describe his, himself in 1870 or 1871 as an anarchist. Huh? The, the, the word itself appears later. He's A, a revolutionary socialist, and B, an anti-authoritarian socialist. Huh? And it's only eventually that anarchism will develop, and it will develop in a very fragmented way, because uh, even in Bakunin, we can find at least two different options. Huh? The one that will orient itself towards direct action, uh, and uh, small groups, direct action, possibly even communities, okay, creating some kind of autonomous spaces and so on. But we also have the other branch, which is also present in some of Bakunin's elaboration of revolutionary syndicalism, which is something very different, okay, uh, because it involves heavily structured mass unions themselves, seeing themselves as the future selves of uh, socialist society. And actually, in late 19th century France, this was the dominant current this, in, within the workers' movement. They attracted by far the most combative uh, people in numbers, huh? uh, particularly with the creation, with the creation of, the, uh, of the CGT, the Confédération Générale du Travail, so the, the, the main uh, historical French uh, trade union, which was dominated heavily by uh, revolutionary syndicalism. Huh? Uh, so these strategical options appear and emerge as such during the, the commune, during the co uh, after the commune, pardon me. During the commune, there is much more flux. Let me, let me take an example which is very familiar to um, Caroline. It's André Léo, and she, she, made, she described brilliantly her trajectory in, in the book, of course, and uh, I learned a lot from uh, reading, reading her. There, there is not much uh, in, in French. Uh, as far as I know, one monograph, uh, but a very good one by Alain Delotel, uh, who also wrote the only existing one, at least I'm sure for is of, of uh, Paul Manc, uh, a book that is out of print since uh, uh, 40 years, I think, uh, the, the, the monograph on, on Paul Manc. So there's André Léo... Oh, I'm sorry, I just want to say there's a collection of essays on uh, uh, André Léo. Uh, La vie, I think it's Les vies d'André Léo. Yes, 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 yes. yes. We, we have now more of the texts that have been uh, uh, reissued. By the way, it's also the case of the literary work of uh, Louise Michel, uh, that is also, this is also very interesting. But André Léo, before the commune, uh, is a socialist, but a socialist of a rather moderate, gradualist uh, way, putting the weight on instruction, on you know, diffusing a kind of cultural change, uh, as uh, 
to prepare the, the, uh, the train for uh, uh, the emancipation of women within the broader framework, of course, of, of social emancipation. But during the commune, she will very strongly support military action. I mean, she will campaign very strongly. This is brilliantly, I mean, described by Carmen in, in her book. She will make the strongest case, actually, for military, the strongest with, with Mitriev and the Union des Femmes, for direct military involvement. And she will criticize very heavily uh, the men, uh, Dombrovsky particularly, who will oppose uh, this uh, participation of women in uh, the National Guard and in the military dimension of, 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 of the commune. Uh, André Léo puts a lot of emphasis on education during the commune, of course. She writes a lot. Uh, she, she agitates in favor of uh, changing education and, and so on, of liberating this from uh, the grips of the, of, of the church and so on. At the same time, so there is this, you know, democratic and from the bottom up, if you like, but she's also a very strong supporter of Louis Roussel. She's an admirer of Roussel, and she will participate in the plot to give the dictatorship to Roussel. And we have to understand the reasons why. And first of all, the term dictatorship meant something completely different at that time from what it came to signify later on. But there was a real problem with the worsening of the military situation of, of, of the commune. And the fact that everyone agreed, actually, that the way things were organized, or rather disorganized, uh, on the military side, with the duality between the Central Committee of the National Guard and uh, the Council of, of the Commune, and it has to be said also, uh, with the level of democratic self-organization within the National Guard that make the execution of orders a very, very complex uh, uh, issue. So there was the need for some kind of, you know, st structuring in a better way this military uh, dimension. And uh, uh, André Léo uh, was very much in favor of a very strong command, military commandment and of Roussel being uh, the head of this. So you see that in, in, in the flux uh, uh, and in, 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 the, in the direct action, people somehow change. I'm not totally convinced if André Léo, to take again the example, because she's a very central figure, you see, um, uh, before the commune, uh, what prepares the ground uh, in the working class neighborhoods of Paris is the movement of public meetings. Huh? It starts in 1868 with the liberalization of the Bonapartist regime. The first of these meetings, it is described in very vivid terms by Gustave Le Français in his memoirs. Uh, the first of these meetings is, mind you, on women's rights. And the main speaker is André Léo. And uh, Le Français himself, uh, who is quite open to these issues, right? he was very close to Pauline Roland in the uh, 1848 revolutions and so on, but he's rather skeptical about the point André Léo makes in 1868, uh, which is political rights for women, actually. So I'm not, I'm not convinced totally if during the Commune it's a kind of theorized position that you know political rights are unimportant and uh, will build a kind of entirely alternative model that will completely sideline political rights. I think that it's essentially the, the produce of a situation of absolute emergency. Everyone was aware that raising the point of political rights for women during the commune was first of all doomed to fail, be totally, as Carolyn just said, abstract for the overwhelming majority of women, given the concrete situation of the besieged city and so on. And therefore, another road had to be invented. Uh, and this was exactly the emergence of a working class feminism that, uh, uh, that, that emerged in, in that time. And that played a role, not only raising the issue of women's emancipation, this is a point um, I emphasize and in the French collection of, my, of, the, of the essays, I bring nearly all the documents of the Union des Femmes. The Union des Femmes and Dmitri F. more particularly, uh, didn't just raise the point of women's emancipation, they raised the point of reorganizing labor in its totality. They worked very closely with the commission of labor of the commune, which was uh, led by another prominent member of the international, Leo Frankel, very close to, to Marx uh, uh, as well. There was a strong connection between them, probably a kind of failed affair also between uh, uh, on the side of uh, Frankel to, to Dmitriev. She didn't reciprocate, uh, uh, apparently. But apart from this, 
uh, what is crucial is their political collaboration and uh, the Union des Femmes, Dmitry F. Lemel, you know, all these working class militants, uh, uh, Dmitry was the only one not being working class actually uh, in this whole uh, leadership. Uh, they constantly pushed the commune to take more radical measures in the direction of socializing and controlling uh, the means of labor and the means of production. So women play the role in radicalizing the social or socialist program of, this, of the commune as such in total. They were political, the, their role as a political act, actors far exceeds the question of women's emancipation crucial and central uh, as, as, it might, as it might have been. And everyone was aware actually of this, hence also Marx's uh, lessons from, from, from this. So we focused on the women's issue, but I think it's, it's important actually to take this as you know, a thread uh, to illuminate this whole process and how things concretely were, you see, experimented in ways no one expected because the situation was totally and radically new. I, I absolutely. I mean, I absolutely agree. I think, you know, I mean, for so long, anything about women's participation and, and then ultimately gender was completely marginalized from the historiography, um, you know, for, I think for, for two reasons. One, they were women and women have been completely marginalized from the historiography until, you know, 40 years ago. Um, and then also that we you know that the fact that because women were participating in politics outside of government, so much of the historiography focused on the structure of you know the, the commune council and, and the government. But you know exactly as you're saying, Seth, it's the the women are they're half the population, they're half the the participants in the commune, and the significance of what they're doing even now still gets you know marginalized into the little compartment of this is what women did. But I mean, the significance and the centrality of the Union des Femmes, I mean, Dimitria herself as an actor, I mean, beginning with her influence on Marx and in, you know, introducing him, you know, making him think about the potential of the peasant commune and those ideas and the way and she develops a kind of um, associationist socialism that is somewhat Marxist and somewhat rooted in the peasant commune and then creates the Union des Femmes uses, as you said, the Commission of Labor and Exchange under Leo, um, under, uh, um, Leo Frankel to uh, have the, the Commission of Labor and Exchange support them. I mean, they, they supplied space. The Union des Femmes met in almost every arrondissement. It was really the only organization that did that. And so they, get, they were able to get space and resources. And then, and then in the documents, I'm sure you've seen that, that Dmitriev was also pushing to have the um, all of the communes, uh, the um, uniforms uh, be sewn in workshops that were being created by the Union des Femmes. So they were creating producer owned workshops. And, um, and in this, you know, she's you know, talking about the importance of you know, giving control over labor to the workers, looking at what kind of work, what kind of skill is available. So she, the moment Dimitriev arrives in Paris, she meets with Frankel, she meets with Malon, and she meets with uh, women's, organ women's organizers. And then she's trying to assess what, you know, what, is the, what are the skills and what is the need? And you know, how do we reorganize labor? So she, and she, also, she wants to reorganize labor into producer own cooperatives and also to revalue women's labor because it was so marginalized and women were paid half of what men were paid because only because they were women. But interestingly, she does not have any, she makes no move to change the gender division of labor. She is focusing on saying, this is women's labor. Women are skilled at this. This is what they do. And this has value. And this needs to be recognized as such. And also she's putting it out as a model for the, reorganization of labor and she has pragmatic plans because she recognizes that they're operating in a world of capitalism and so she has she lays out plans she has a um, different kinds of uh, commissions within the union des femmes for you know what will they produce and one of the things they're going to produce are hats with feathers and flowers i mean this kind of really sort of a you know luxury item to sell 
internationally. I mean, this is, she's planning this, and this was all done within the context of the commune. So, I mean, she's, she has, she's addressing this on multiple fronts and in direct, you know, directly working with the Commission of Labor and Exchange. And so having this kind of influence also, you know, on the formal um, male dominated government of the commune. And, um, and so the kind of, so what she's doing is so different from what Leo is doing and is so different from what Menk is doing and is different yet from what the working class activists are. And so I think this is, it's, it's, it's important to talk about socialist feminisms and working class feminisms because to reduce it down to one erases these really, really significant distinctions. Great. So um, we're starting to get a few audience questions now. Um, I, I wanted to pose one more before we, um, before we move on and just bring in a theme that I think we haven't touched on as much, um, which is that, you know, one of the most most important strategic legacies of the commune, as I've, as, at least as I've come to know it, has been this theory of the state developed by the communards. Um, and if we think about the legacy of this theory of the state by way of whether Marx's letter to Kugelmann, whether we think of Lenin's state and revolution, we often think of, we use, hear this phrase, smashing the state. Um, Stathis points out that in the final version of the civil war in France, Marx never wrote of, of smashing or, or breaking the state at all. He advocated what Stathis calls a transformation of the state machinery. And I think this is particularly relevant in light of recent debates um, about socialism and, and use of the state, whether we think of, of Podemos and Syriza, Corbyn, Sanders. Um, so I'm interested in what the commune can teach us about each of these approaches and the limits of each of these approaches, smashing on the one hand, and transforming on the other. Um, should I start perhaps? Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, there is a very interesting document to address the issue of the state and the way the communists conceive it. It, it is because um, it's not one of the standard texts of you know, the big name somehow of the socialist tradition, but of one key actor of the commune itself uh, who is very little known, actually, uh, but who wrote a very, who occupied the key position. He was in charge of the public services uh, in the commune. It's Jules Andrieux, and he wrote these notes to serve on the history of the commune, actually. It was uh, uh, published, actually, on the, only the early 70s by Maximilien Rubel and recently reissued. It's very interesting, uh, very interesting stuff. There is also an article he wrote as an emigre in London, published in an, in an English um, journal in, in uh, late 1871. But uh, I mean, the, the full manuscript is more, is more interesting. Uh, Jules Andrieux is certainly not uh, someone who thought that uh, the commune would abolish the state. Huh? Uh, he uh, thinks of himself as a kind of anti osman huh? he, he wants uh, a level of centralization, but on a completely different basis somehow uh, than, than, than Osman. Uh, he's in favor of a, a federal reorganization of France, but as far as Parisian public services are concerned, uh, he is in favor of centralization, and he's in favor of being very cautious with the way we revolutionize somehow the public services and the state machine. He's not at all in favor of the experiments of introducing what we would call, a bit anachronistically, but this is the idea, self-management in uh, those administrations. And there were attempts to some degree successful to do so in some of the public services. The most significant example is the postal service. Huh? The postal service was completely disorganized when the Versailles government uh, left Paris. Huh? They, they threatened actually all the civil servants uh, who stayed in Paris, uh, they threatened them of, of very heavy sanctions if they obeyed um, the, uh, the orders of, of the commune, right? If they, if they executed the decisions of, of the commune. So it was a very difficult task actually to reorganize things huh? because you know, we are talking about a city of already 2 million inhabitants huh? and uh, very dense, okay? With, I mean, it, it's Paris, intramuros, uh, the way, 
we know it now huh, to a very large extent. So you need to run, you know, all the public services to make the daily life possible. And the daily life went fine during the, 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 the Paris Commune. Everything was done, you know, to put chaos in it, but actually it worked. That was very important. I mean, a lot of the communists say we have proved ourselves that, you know, the working class is able somehow, somehow to, make it, to make it work. Now, the extent it, the, the question is to what extent did it work differently on a different basis? And here, you know, it's not very easy because it lasted for only 72 days, because uh, the city was besieged, because it was a constant management of emergencies uh, that needed to be, uh, to be addressed. And because all the existing somehow, you know, human resources, they, they had to be, <laughs> Uh, they, they had to be used, huh? and this is a problem we find again. Huh? Uh, we know in the Russian Revolution the whole difficulty posed by the necessity to have people who are technically competent huh? in, in various key points huh? of the administrative apparatus, but the economic apparatus uh, as well. So the commune was already confronted to this kind to this kind of issues. So there is a gap between the aspiration to put all this under popular control and the way things concrete, concretely worked under the commune, uh, much more so that there were different views about how it should work. Eh? You know, there was a level of agreement about the necessity of popular control, but it's obvious, for instance, that, uh, that uh, between uh, people who were still in the line of Proudhon, of you know, very, very decentralized forms of organization, uh, who very strongly opposed uh, you know, anything going against market constraints and market rules. I mean, Proudhon was a very big defender of the market and of private property. I mean, let's not forget this, right? Uh, this is not at all the line of Elizabeth Wycliffe and the Union des Femmes. Huh? On the contrary, they wanted a federation of workers' organization to control uh, the production and the federation going even beyond national boundaries. Huh? They, they conceived as, you know, possibly other unions outside of France actually organizing internationally the production kind of utopian uh, dream, uh, as it were, but clearly going against the domination of the economy by market and, and, and private property. And uh, Blanquist, as Caroline said, were in favor of much of more centralized and top-down solutions. So there was a level of heterogeneity here and a lot of, you know, experimentation and, and uh, uh, solutions to solve out uh, the, the, absolute, uh, the absolute emergency. What is clear, uh, however, is that um, the commune did allow a level of participation and mass politicization of the Parisian uh, population. And, and to a certain extent, uh, in some key public services, more particularly the postal, uh, the postal service, but also where coins were made and so on, uh, there was a level of participation of workers in, uh, uh, if not an abolition of the hierarchy, at least of putting into question the way traditionally hierarchy was organized within those uh, workplaces, also in some parts of the arms industry uh, that was all already under mun municipal and public control because very little was actually socialized uh, during the commune. Actually, only one factory, I think, was uh, concretely uh, uh, socialized. The decree that was voted uh, under the pressure of the Union des Femmes, among other things, by uh, Leo Frankel's initiative on April the 16th um, uh, didn't apply actually, didn't uh, uh, concretely uh, materialize. Uh, so uh, that was the orientation, that was the aspiration, but the concrete realization was only a very small, uh, was very a small part of this. Uh, hence the meaning of those formulations of the commune as an experimental form, right? Not as a ready-made solution to be copied and so on, but an indication of a direction of, you know, where, where, where should we go to, where should we aspire to, and some very concrete, of course, procedures and measures that have been tested somehow concretely, to a certain extent, uh, very sufficiently, uh, of course, but that are indications of that tendency towards something, a new form of social organization of the future. Um. In, in terms of the way that the, uh, the commune functions and it's it functioned and its priorities to sort of just uh, just briefly continue on what, what you were saying, Stathis, that um, 
something that, that I, I find fascinating is the Bibliothèque Nationale, which, um, and, and I think that the commune saw the functioning of the Bibliothèque Nationale, the National Library, as part of a public service. And Elie Reclou, the, one of the brothers of uh, Elisee Reclou, the anarchist geographer, took over the Bibliothèque Nationale with no particular um, you know, bibliography experience um, and, and really prioritized making this a library for the people. And, it, and spoke about how uh, during the previous regimes that the bourgeoisie and aristocracy had, had stolen the, the books that were part of the patrimony. And, and so they really thought of the library as a public service, which I think kind of also speaks to some of the central ideas about, you know, about, about life, about what the commune saw as, as important in life, work and education and thought. And so for the state, to, or the, the, the government itself, to, to view this, uh, the Bibliothèque Nationale's functioning expansion and opening, is, I, thought, is, I think is very telling. Um, and in, in terms of the thought about the state, uh, I mentioned briefly that um, Paul Mank, who it, it, she, she did not identify, she didn't call herself an anarchist you know, during the commune, but after the commune, when she shifted to, really shifted significantly to become a, 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 a top-down kind of revolutionary socialist follower of Blanqui, she spoke as having had been an anarchist and having seen that she felt that centralization was vital, that the commune showed that the absence of a strong central kind of power that was cohesive was one of the reasons the commune failed. And, and then the exact opposite was um, Louise Michel, who was much more, much more of a, a, a Blanquiste and um, a uh, top-down conspiratorial socialist. And she becomes an anarchist and she writes about how she actually, she becomes an anarchist on the boat when she's being exiled to New Caledonia. Uh, Natalie Lamel, who had worked with uh, Dmitriev in the, so centrally on the Union des Femmes, Natalie Lamel, who had identified as an anarchist during the commune, um, she tells, you know, Louise, Louise Michel is distraught and, you know, having seen the slaughter and the, and the crushing of this, you know, extraordinary event and, um, it's, and, and feels at a loss for what kind of politics is a response to it. And, um, and this is two years after the commune, she's in prison for, for two years. And, and uh, Natalie Lamella tells her, basically tells her about anarchism and, and Michelle embraces anarchism and begins to theorize it. And she spends, well, much of the rest of her life the theorizing anarchism through uh, many, many um, uh, ways, through, through uh, her um, fiction and her political writings and her activism. But her years, her seven years in uh, New Caledonia in the prison colony, she is really just very, very focused on trying to see what, what, what does one need to do now? And she believes that the state is not an option, that one has to smash the state, that the state is just not, that you just cannot, um, it, you cannot rely on it, it cannot take it over, uh, that she is you know, arguing for a, uh, revolutionary universality on a global level, and she's theorizing and planning for it and, and writing it. And so it's the event itself has these fundamentally oppositional effects on you know, these two particular uh, revolutionary women um, who remain allies and actually who spend decades uh, speaking together, even though they have a very different kind of politics with a very different kind of end goal. But it's I think it's indicative of um, in some ways, the capaciousness, in some ways, the contradictions, uh, in some ways, the inconclusiveness of, of what happens in the uh, revolutionary context. So I wanted to, um, to bring in a couple audience questions here. Um, there's a number of people asking questions about contemporary relevance of the commune. So um, one person asks about the relationship between the commune and, and Occupy Wall Street. Um, Another asks about the quotidian presence of the commune in Paris today and whether this may or may not be helpful for leftists. Um, 
And so, you know, it, even if we take this as a broader opportunity to talk about contemporary relevance of the commune, I think short of October 1917, no event, um, you know, occupies such a, a place in the contemporary communist imagination. And so thinking about the relevance of, of the commune for today. Should I be in? Um, sure, yeah, I know it's a big one. <laughs> I know, well, <laughs> I, know. Um, I think as, as we've seen, the commune has, um, has popped up all over. It is, I mean, I think that it's, its relevance and presence have been, have been, have existed virtually continuously since the event itself. You know, I mean, in in um, in the immediate decades afterwards, uh, there were all sorts of references uh, to the comment Lucy Parsons, the uh, American socialist feminist. I mean, I could just list the the um, anarchist feminist revolutionaries in different contexts. The the, the Shanghai Commune. The, I mean, it just again and again Occupy Wall Street. You know, I mean, right now the you know the the rescue boat Louise Michel. Right, I mean, on the Mediterranean. And so I think, you know, this, it just really speaks to the, sig the significance, the myth, and the reality. I mean, the myth keeps it in people's minds and it allows them to adapt it to their particular kind of context, but the reality of the commune and, and, and what had happened and the kind of capacious alternative options that it presented and suggested and attempted, it, it, it remains like the touchstone and the thing that, that activists can look at and say, you know, this, this is an image that I want to embrace. This is something I want to um, learn from, follow, uh, you know, attach myself to. And I mean, Paris today, right now, um, I had hoped to be in Paris for this uh, event, but you know, COVID. So uh, I'm in Milwaukee, but um, Paris, these last months, the, the, the celebrations, I mean, the celebrations and commemorations are highly contested because the French government wants to recognize the fact that yes, we had this revolution 150 years ago, but they do not want to celebrate it. And obviously a lot of people want to and will and do and are and have been celebrating it. But the, just the fact of the level of its contentiousness, again, speaks to the threat it was and is to the right and the moment of, of hope and optimism and potential that it, it was and is um, to the left. Right. Caroline, was it? Did you have other things to say? Oh, I just thought I would stop so you could take a chance. I just yeah. wasn't sure if we were okay. running out of. Yeah, okay. I'll, to... I'll, yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, I'll start from where you start. First of all, you know, the relevance or the actuality, as we might say, of the commune is not, is not essentially a matter of, you know, how we see things or project. I mean, we here meaning, you know, the people who are inspired one way or another by the commune. Uh, it has essentially to do with the people we have in front of us, uh, with uh, whom we are confronted. And I'm afraid that uh, uh, France, and particularly under Macron, but uh, even before, is ruled by the real uh, descendants of the, of the Versailles. And, and they are very much aware of this. I mean, Macron himself, uh, uh, a couple of years ago, in a documentary said, uh, made, made the following statement, each time the Republic has been threatened, it found refuge in Versailles, mind you. So he didn't make it more explicit, but he doesn't need to make it more uh, explicit. And the kind of official historian of the, uh, uh, the French establishment and regime in a way, Pierre Nora, um, made the following astounding statement in March, when asked about, you know, 
where it is uh, desirable to celebrate the commune. And he said, celebrate Napoleon. It's the 150th anniversary of Napoleon's uh, uh, death as well. So Napoleon, yes, the commune, no. And he even added to show you how, you know, things are, he obviously lied as, as a historian. I mean, as a historian, he's famous for having edited a collective work in the 70s called Places of Memory, right? So this guy who became famous as a historian for that lied in front of millions of people in the most popular radio um, show of the French public broadcast, uh, declaring that, you know, in 1971 for the 100th anniversary of the commune, the right-wing president of the Republic of the time, Georges Pompidou, went to um, the cemetery of, of Père Lachaise and put his, down his knee on uh, the wall of the communards, which shows us, Nora continued, that you know, no one cares about the commune. It's not a threat to the, to, the, to the existing order anymore. It's just an element of history. But this is a lie. This is a total lie. Pompidou never went in the 100th anniversary. On the contrary, there were massive demonstrations by all the varieties of the currents of the left, uh, the radical left and uh, the workers' movement of, of, of the time with hundreds of thousands of people, uh, you know, celebrating, uh, celebrating it. So the commune is a founding event. Uh, this means two things that first of all, it has within itself more than one possibility. So all those threads, they are in a way part of the commune. Huh? None of them holds the kind of essential truth of, of the commune because all founding events have this kind of multiplicity of meanings and all of them unfold in the following history. The discussion is, because not everything is, is, you know, should be put at the same level, you know, which is the most productive, where, what are the aspects that, that prove being more productive, less productive, and so on and so forth. And, and here, of course, the serious discussion starts. Huh? What should we do with the state, for instance? Huh? Um, positions were not as fixed as one can imagine huh? in, the, in the years after the commune. Huh? Divergences clearly appear. I mean, Caroline mentioned, you know, the radical anti-state position of Louis Michel. This is true. Eh? Kropotkin more or less develops on a similar line, okay? Pure horizontalism, eh? as, we, uh, as we should say today. But this is not the case of other libert libertarian socialists, eh? opponents of Marx. Eh? For instance, if you read uh, Arthur Arnoux, Arnoux eh? a, a, a very important figure of uh, uh, the commune, very close to Bakunin and Elisee Reclus in his uh, uh, emigration and exile in, in Switzerland. He wrote a very important popular and parliamentarian, I never quite understood the title, History of the Commune, in which he says that um, we, means the minority, the kind of anti-authoritarian minority of the commune, where basically we were wrong. I mean, we didn't provide any alternative solution for the real issues, the real problems that did exist, particularly on the military side. He advocates um, the need for a centralized military commandment. This was the position of Rossel, uh, Rossel to whom I mentioned before. He was at that time, until he resigned in May, but he was in charge, he was the military commander of the, of the, of the commune. Um, from late April until some uh, point in, in, uh, in May. So Arnoux says we needed a centralized military commandment, even a dictatorship. We need a certain number of public services to sort out issues on a nationwide level. And he lists you know, all the various public services that need the centralized administration. But for all the rest, we need federal solution, self-organization from below, and so on and so forth. And Gustave Le Francais is on the same line, actually. In his memoirs, he says even uh, the state in the future will be reduced to a general delegation of public services. And he will polemicize with uh, Kropotkin and uh, other anarchists, saying that you know their views are unrealistic and unfaithful, actually, uh, to what the commune uh, uh, trying trying to do and 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 by the way, Kropotkin himself in his seminal essay on the commune is very critical of the commune. He's very critical. He says the commune 
was still too close to government, uh, to centralization, to parliamentarianism. We need to move radically in another, in another direction. So you see, there is a whole range of position between, let's say, the transformative uh, position of Marx and Engels, combining elements of destruction and elements of construction, uh, uh, libertarian socialists of a certain strand and radical anti-statist uh, anarchists. It's no accident if we find similar positions in debates today. Huh? I mean, uh, uh, these are still ongoing issues huh? in, in anti-capitalist uh, movements uh, in a way all, all around the world. Huh? Uh, in, in Latin America, uh, we know the, the, okay, from the Zapatistas to uh, uh, the Venezuela, uh, I mentioned Kurdistan. Um, what we need nevertheless to have in mind concerning the commune, because I think it's still topical for us today. No, uh, sorry, the commune was not just Occupy Wall Street. The commune was really a form of political power based on a massive military power. We are talking about nearly 300,000 men in arms and a few women towards the end of, of the commune. But we are talking about people who were constantly fighting in a military way, who had seized power in the capital city of, of, of the country, right? And they wanted to expand this experiment with, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in other cities and in the rest of the territory and reorganize totally the Republic. Huh? I mean, uh, uh, the Republic remained the king word of, of the commune, but a, a Republic that should be refounded, reorganized in a radically democratic uh, way combining a very strong dimension of self-organization and power coming from below without abolishing national unity. That is a point that was very much put forward by the commune. It's not about abolishing, you know, uh, from one day to another uh, national boundaries. They had internationalist principles. Huh? Leo Franco was accepted as a foreigner elected in the council of, of, of the commune, but they didn't want to abolish uh, 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 from one day to another, abruptly, uh, national boundaries. Huh? They, didn't, they, they, they emphasized the needs for centralized administrations concerning key issues. So when Marx says that, you know, there are limited but very important functions that still need to be centralized at the level of the nation or at the macro level, uh, if you like, he's very faithful, actually, to what the commune intended huh, in, in its programmatic texts uh, uh, to do. Um, so, you know, I think that uh, today, for instance, when, um, uh, I don't know, in the liberated zones of Kurdistan uh, or in Venezuela, they are experimenting with forms of communal self-organization from below, they are very much aware that in order to be viable, uh, they need to be articulated with elements of centralization huh? they, in, in Latin America or, or even in Kurdistan. And in both cases, we are talking about processes which have a very important military dimension. So I don't think that, of course, you know, the military, I'm not suggesting that, you know, now we need to put forward the military dimension in uh, countries like the US or France, etc. By the way, I'm not sure if in the US people putting forward uh, military dimension are especially left wing. Uh, my impression is that we are rather on the other part of the divide, but correct me. If I'm, if I'm wrong um, in that respect. So strategically, the way to organize ourselves in the political struggle, you know, a lot more of innovation um, is of course uh, necessary. The notions of parties, of political organization, of trade unions, all this needs to be reworked, rethink and so on. Nevertheless, when we talk about the reality of a new power, a power that comes after a moment of revolutionary rupture, and there are still processes going in that, direction in the world today, huh? whether they claim uh, the legacy of the commune or not, we know in advance that we will be confronted with similar problems and issues. And therefore, we need the most productive methods to address these issues and not, you know, to somehow dilute the problems by saying, you know, by some kind of miracle, self-organization is the key to everything, or on the contrary, centralization and a strong leadership and honest leadership will be uh, the solutions of, of, of the problem. No, uh, these two dimensions of, you know, the vertical and the horizontal, they are the inescapable uh, dimension of every uh, 
uh, emancipatory form of uh, political reorganization of society? I think, um, I think you know, I, I mentioned something about you know, the myth of the commune. And I think that because the commune has this mythical kind of uh, nature and stature that, that people do, you, they, they can use it for all sorts of things. And it becomes, it can become devoid of meaning. I mean, think, I think exactly what you're saying stuff is, is, is you know, the, it's, it's a question of, you know, the commune was not, was not Occupy Wall Street. I mean, well, it, 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 it has connections in, 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 um, in ideal and in references, but I think that there's a kind of, um, uh, I don't, danger is probably the wrong word, but the, the, the fact that where there's a historical event of such significance and such capaciousness, but there is such a tendency for people in the aftermath to not understand the historical event and to not recognize what it actually was or what it meant and even you know, multiple uh, interpretations of it and just to find it you know, as, a, as a kind of a convenient thing to use. And, and I'm not, and, and sometimes it's, it's a meaningful convenient thing to, to use, but to say that certain kinds of um, social movements are equivalent to the commune, I think you know, just reflects um, a lack of historical awareness and uh, it's a bit of a mixed bag because on the one hand, you know, the French government and educational authorities would like the commune to be to disappear. I mean, they're not going to teach about it in school. They haven't in a long time. And so uh, when it becomes popularized. Even now, uh, it's out of school programs. Even I know. Now. I know. I mean, for a long time it has been. And so at least when it's popularized, it's in the public imaginary. You get a mix of people who are sort of like, you know, well, it's on their t-shirt, which is not necessarily a bad thing again, but that was, if that's all that it means, but at least then it, it, it raises the, it, it puts it in the public imaginary. I mean, these last couple of months. And so then you have at least a number of people thinking, what was this event that has, that was formative to the, our, our history and the country and, and, to the, to the West and it, it, it's influence goes beyond the West. It's like, what, is this, what does this mean? And so it's a kind of an interesting question about what happens when something is popularized and commodified and when it loses meaning, can that in some ways lead back to a, at least steps towards awareness and greater understanding? I mean, I'm not sure about it, but I, I think it's just kind of an interesting thing. It's an interesting question. And I wanted to um, give Philip a chance to, to ask a question. I know he had a pair of questions and so maybe he can come in and ask them live. Oh, thanks, Zach. And thank you, Carolyn and Stathis for wonderful presentations. I think both of you actually answered both of my questions in a rather thorough way. But I will sort of pose a kind of framing, an alternate framing of some of them. My, my two questions centered around the idea of uh, legibility of the 100 year cycle of, from the French Revolution to the Commune, or maybe illusory legibility. And the second, what I call maybe revolutionary bricolage or the role of misreading uh, by later events. And I'm thinking particularly of 68, so I'll, go forward with my ideas. Uh, you know, the, the, that cycle of French history seems like uh, a multi-authored novel, just because so, uh, you know, you, you see Stendhal capturing the period of reaction from starting from Waterloo to 1830. You go to Balzac, where everybody is trying to make money, enrich yourself up to 48. There's a little bit of Flaubert, plus Marx comes in, and then one gets Zola and so forth up to the commune. And uh, it's also visible to us, I think, because the cast of characters and the classes stand out marked by sumptuary codes. We know that the person wearing the black frock coat and the black top hat is a bourgeois. There's no, it's unmistakable from painting or wherever. And the question I wanted to ask is, is uh, I've always, when I try to transpose 
a particular sequence or even a particular class composition to America, maybe even now or later, it's hard to see them come out in exactly the same way from let's say a republic that starts off with slave owners, a bunch of farmers out on the frontier and so forth, but not many people walking around in frock coats. So again, I guess that's the question of transposability and legibility of kind of reading uh, sequences in the, in the sense that people are uh, looking at, uh, they say Marx is German philosophy, English economics and French politics. And the people who say English economics uh, are going after the notion of England as some kind of para, pra, paradigmatic road to capitalism and seeing it as idiosyncratic. And I wonder if this notion of the paradigmatic politics paradigmatic politics in France along that cycle uh, is, is, has started to attract the same sort of questions about its legibility or applicability uh, that the economic uh, origins of capitalism are. I don't know if that question makes sense at all, but uh, I think in some way you sort of, an you answered it in your last, your last notion of, uh, 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 Philip, uh, I don't know if I might be a bit, you know, off, if not off subject, but not address perhaps straight, I mean, frontally your question, but let me put it, I think it's, is it a bit the issue of strategy that you want to raise in a way? I mean, le let me put it this way. Um, I think that contradictory as they might have been, all those strategic orientations coming after the commune, developing after the commune inside the revolutionary and the workers' movement. So Marxism, by the way, the, the term itself appears at that moment. Huh? It doesn't exist before, huh? and it appears polemically at the first point and during those disputes between the various currents of the, the workers' movement. So Marxism, uh, anarchism, but itself, you know, anarchism means several things. Huh? means um, uh, Kropotkin, means uh, uh, small communes, means direct action, means revolutionary syndicalism. So there are, you know, many, many different, uh, many different things. Or more moderate, of course, forms of, um, you know, more parliamentary or electoral politics and electoral socialism and, and, and so on. So there is a complex relation between all these dimensions. And by the way, Marx, Marxism as such doesn't feel, fit exactly with either of these. Huh? I mean, Marxists, they, they were on the electoral terrain, but they, they didn't want to limit themselves in the electoral uh, terrain. Huh? It's only the right wing of social democracy that develops later on that really wants to um, evacuate the dimension of a revolutionary rupture, uh, as it were. However, what all these currents have in common are two things. Huh? Um, the first is, um, in a way, negatively, uh, all of them draw a fundamental lesson, not only from the commune, but more particularly from the bloody weak, uh, which means from the repression against the commune by a bourgeois government in which most, not all, but most of its members were bourgeois republicans, right? So this, particularly from a French standpoint, meant that, you know, there are uh, we need to organize ourselves autonomously, separately, and in opposition with uh, the bourgeois camp, if you like, with the bourgeois side, including its most democratic, if you like, and progressive elements, uh, which was not the case before. Huh? In, in the period before the commune, the perception and the consciousness was that there was a kind of broad Republican party in France, heterogeneous, of course, with different and various options, but you know, none of these people were somehow mortal enemies. Huh? After the commune, they are mortal enemies. So, so and, and, and some moment of confrontation is uh, therefore on the agenda. Huh? And, and we need to organize separately. Huh? We need uh, a spirit that will put uh, our, our camp in an autonomous position from the camp of the bourgeoisie, even if, you know, the the options do not coincide in 
the attitude they advocate vis-a-vis -vis the political institutions, representative institutions, uh, trade unionism, and, 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 and so on. That, that's one thing. The second thing is that um, none of these currents actually believes that the commune, the, the road uh, going to revolution will be just a repetition of uh, the insurrection that uh, gave birth to the commune. Huh? So in the sense, everyone agrees with what, you know, some historians make a big fuss about the fact that the commune is the last revolution of the 19th century, blah, 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 blah. But everyone knows that, sorry, everyone knows that. That, that's, that's exactly the starting point of what all these contemporary actors of the revolutionary movement trying to do. They, because the commune could not be repeated as such, because it was in, indeed the last of the Parisian uh, and revolutions of, and, and this cycle uh, starting with in 89 and ending with uh, the bloody week, all of them explored alternative options actually mass political parties participation in the electoral process but not you know limiting yourself to this mass trade unions a general strike and uh, the union itself becoming the organizing self of a future society direct action and use of violence but not as a preparation for an armed insurrection as an example to stimulate somehow consciousness of broader layers of the population and uh, uh, to bring them to, to the struggle, right? Um, so, uh, or, you know, let's retreat in, in, in the countryside and uh, create, you know, autonomous spaces already liberated uh, and so on and so forth. But, you know, unfortunately, uh, at some point, we know in advance that uh, we will be repressed uh, and, and so on and so forth. So everyone explores strategically something different, okay, to the common. Everyone is aware of the fact that indeed, a kind of century of a certain form of revolutionary struggle is over with the commune and that new forms of organizing, depending on the situations, of course, uh, need to be invented because obviously Tsarist Russia uh, is not uh, Republican France because obviously uh, parliamentary, you know, uh, uh, Britain uh, is not the same as, I don't know, the Austro-Hungarian Empire or uh, uh, not to speak, of course, of the colonial situations and so on, which are, which you know, are just emerging as issues and and uh, uh, points of of uh, theorization for the revolutionary movement at at, at the time. Uh, so this is where the real terrain is. Uh, no one is dreaming actually of a pure repetition of the commune, except in a purely imaginary uh, way. Uh, I mean, Louis Michel, for instance, imagines a future revolution but she uses constantly allegories and metaphors to describe it, which is a very clear sign that she doesn't really believe that somehow a kind of, you know, a new commune just repeating the 1871 experience will emerge. Uh, hence, you know, the proliferation of allegorical images uh, to name something that cannot be properly, for with Michel at least, represented as such, something that is still unknown, something that has to be invented, some, something that needs to be thought at another level uh, of, if you like, political imagination, including strategic, of course, uh, imagination. And I think that this is the kind of imagination we very crucially need today. That sounds like a good point to end on, a combined and uneven struggle, political ima imagination, and expect at some point down the road a violent reaction from the, the powers that rule. Um, thank you very much, uh, Stathis and Carolyn. Uh, uh, be sure and uh, uh, Stathis, uh, you, uh, Zach said that you have a book with your essay, uh, your three-part thing that you did for Verso, uh, which is Writings from the Commune. Um, it's, it's a collection of, uh, it combines three things, a collection of uh, Marx and Engels essays with revised uh, uh, translations and new translations, a selection of texts of the commune itself, uh, and the selection of texts of contemporary of Marx and Engels, uh, including Kropotkin, uh, William Morris, uh, Gustave Le Français, um, Bakunin, uh, etc., who 
give you know kind of a not of, of, of other views but this is in French okay this came out in, in, in French. oh is it is it coming in is it coming out in English or uh, I don't think so because most of this material is, is already available in different oh. in different ways but my own essay which is uh, 150 pages long is entirely has been translated into English and is freely uh, available on Versus website. I suppose that you know you have a way to give this indication in your uh, uh, right. in, in your own uh, in the, uh... right. And and Carolyn, uh, the name of your book again is um, the the, a brief, the Paris Commune: A Brief History is uh, right. coming out with Rutgers at the end of this year, um, and that is exactly as it sounds. And then uh, my other book is Feminism's Empire, which looks at fem the intersections of feminism and imperialism in later 19th century France. And uh, that centers on uh, five different feminists, one of whom is Louise Michel. So it's Louise Michel in the aftermath of the commune. And, and it has a lot to do with, about uh, how ideas of, of race and imperialism and anti-imperialism emerge from the, the, from the event. Um, and I also have a, a recent essay um, that Rohr published on Elizabeth Dimitriou uh, during the Commune and the Union des Femmes. So feminism beyond the incendiaries. <laughs> okay, oh, yes. so thank you very much. And, and Zach, I bow to you for pulling this together. Specter, you are great. Mm -hmm. uh, and thanks, oh, th for thanks to Red May. <laughs> And, and uh, well, now that you mentioned, you know, uh, it's not our last event for the day. Uh, we have a three o'clock event, which is just in two hours with Paul North and Paul Ryder on a new English translation of Capital with Ever Osorio Ruiz as the moderator. So please come and watch that. Tomorrow we have, we still want everything at 11 a.m. but a 50th anniversary of Nanny Balestrini's book. Uh, and another Spectre panel on Amazon, the, the drive for uh, organizing at Amazon in Alabama. That's at 2 p.m. with David McNally, Mike Goldfield, Goldfield and Donna Merch. Also go to our website uh, and uh, click on Fan the Fames of Red May or donate. We need your money to keep going uh, to do this event next year. Uh, this is our fifth anniversary. It's rather amazing that we've been able to do this for five years. And uh, also you can become a patron, uh, four levels of Patreon from three to $20. So once again, I hope to see you again at uh, 3 p.m. Pacific time today. Everybody enjoy the rest of the day wherever you are in the world.